I think you live in a day and time now where people are beginning to doubt whether or not the Lord's still coming. I'm beginning to see preachers who once were staunch and stood firmly on the pre-tribulation rapture. Now all of a sudden they're beginning to jellyfish and starting to prepare people for the tribulation. I've seen them cast their schooling aside and their doctrine aside just to placate the people because they're concerned about being able to minister to people that are so downtrodden and distressed. God made you a promise and He said He would never leave you and He'd never forsake you. Amen. But He didn't say He would always deliver you. Amen. The deliverance comes in eternity and sometimes there's things that we go through down here we don't get physical deliverance from. Sometimes you have a disease that will stay with you the rest of your life doesn't mean God deserted you, but it does mean that God sometimes gets more value out of broken things than He does out of whole things. And sometimes God allows us to be a testimony for His grace in spite of our predicament. But the fact of the matter is, is that oftentimes we cry for physical relief and we don't always find it. I'll try to make sense for some of that to you today because now you're living in a day where people are concerned about everything from finances to physical health to their mental well-being to their own families and situations occurring that are there. And now you're even beginning to see an uptick in the persecution of Christians for your faith. And I wish I could tell you today with great assurance that all that's fixing to get better. But unless the Lord comes today, the promise is, is that it's not going to get better. And I can't lie to you and tell you that it is, and then it get worse, and then you'll know I'm a liar. I can tell you that God's still going to get you through. Amen. Look, if you will, Isaiah chapter 40, very familiar passage. Come all the way down to verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth... That's just a good title for a message. <laughs> I'm going to give you a, an attribute of Him. Fainteth not, neither is weary. There's no searching of His understanding. Here's a promise to you. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, He increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Amen. Brother Larry, you pray, would you please? Father, Lord, as we come before you this morning, we're grateful, Lord, first of all, being in this place. We thank you for what we've heard already in the previous hour and then the, the songs that you were, were so grateful, Lord, to give us through those messengers, the talent that's given, and we, we thank you for that, Lord. Now we come to the message and we pray for this preacher, your yeah. man. Lord, we, we, don't, uh, we don't know what the next hour of the day or the month may hold for us, but we're grateful, Lord, that... We realize that we can live in as much, most of a surrendered state as we can to you and that your will might be done in our life if we'll pray that way. Realize, Lord, that that's, again, a tall order, but, Lord, it is possible through you, and we know that. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for your encouragement through the Word. Thank you for that that you give us if we'll just, if we could say, show up, Lord, in your presence and have a want to. Uh, to continue for you. We realize that continue is not, not always a fast pace, but God, it's a forward pace. And sometimes you hold us a little still, we thank you for that and give us some rest, but we look forward to what you have for us next. Now the next is this hour. You, you're going to give us some preaching through this man. And we pray for him. I pray for liberty, free course for the word. But, but, but
But as much as that, Lord, for our hearts to be prepared in a manner, even if it has to be prepared right now, and things put to the side, that we might take the Word in. Yes. Lord, we need it. We, this is the most important part of our life. Amen. Uh, the spiritual part. The flesh can run crazy and left to the right. But Lord, our, our, the stableness in our life is the Word of God in our lives. Amen. And Your presence. So we thank You for Your presence. We thank You for the Word. We thank You for this man in messenger form this morning, our preacher. Be with him, Lord. Rest upon the Word. Breathe on it as it comes forth. Yes. We're going to give You all the glory for what's said and done now. In Jesus Christ's name we ask. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. I'll give you just a few things that generally have a propensity, a tendency for people to lose their faith or to lose what I'll call for the sake of the message here, their security. Oftentimes, you spend a lot of time as you get a little older, you get married, you have kids, kids grow up, they go to college or get married. And you begin to think as time runs down, what about the long term? you recognize or you realize right off the bat that you're not going to be able to continue on as a young man or a young woman for the rest of your life. And this is where if you're not careful, bitterness can really creep in. Because you can get bitter that now that you have enough to maybe to be able to enjoy a few things in life, you no longer have the physical stamina or ability to be able to enjoy the things in life. And the things that you used to think you'd want to do, you might still want to do, but you just don't feel like you have the time to do that anymore. And it sort of begins to lose its luster. Why, even over in the Old Testament, money failed over there in Egypt, and then it failed in Canaan, and the next thing you know, they're over there talking to Joseph, man, we got to do something because the money's failed. I'm hearing that starting again. I see commercials that are on a regular basis. Your money is not secure. The banks are failing. And, and we're having to worry about now whether or not the stock market's going to crash. And you need to buy gold or you need to buy silver or you need to have this or put it up there. Invest in this, invest in that. Man's always making an attempt to ensure the furtherance of his life. And yet he is so careless when it comes to the furtherance of eternity. Yeah. Christians are not as concerned about that, but I find nowadays that Christians are beginning to worry about something they've worked so hard for all their life. And what's beginning to happen is the pressure on young people that are behind me is I have to have X amount of dollars to be able to ensure that I'm going to be there. But now they're beginning to hear the rumblings of no matter how much you have, it may not be worth anything. Can I just remind you, when the depression hit, everybody that was prepared, it didn't make any difference. And you study that and people jumping out of windows and people committing suicide and people losing everything that they did and everything that they had. Can I just tell you that there's something more than monetary assurance or security that will provide for you a whole lot better than just whether or not you happen to have the money to be able to pay the bills. I'm for you paying your bills. You've heard me tell before about the dentist that wound up leaving the church and the preacher finally stopped them and said to him, you know, why is it that you're actually leaving? And he said, I'm really tired of hearing a choir sing through unpaid for teeth. <laughs> you know, most of the individuals in the world out there forgive you of pretty much everything except paying your bills. I mean, literally, you look at the stuff they'll forgive you of, they'll pretty much write it all off. But boy, if you're a scoundrel and don't pay your bills, uh, that, have a, that has a speak, speaks volumes about you. But can I say this to you? When the Lord said that He will provide all your needs, it doesn't always mean all your wants. Amen. I've seen individuals that were as prepared as they could possibly be prepared and some physical tragedy come their way and everything they thought they were prepared for it didn't prepare them for it. And the next thing you know, everything they had was gone. Listen, and recently that hurricane that came through there, some people lost everything they had. One elderly lady back there in the days of Katrina, she came up there and uh, they called a preacher that lived north of her up in Alabama there and said, can we come stay with you? Everything we have is completely washed out to sea. Our house and all the things that were there, what was left of it is at least 10 feet underwater. We literally have nothing at all left of what we spent a lifetime preparing for. I don't know about you, but I think that would be rather devastating. Yeah. 
I think that would be a hard or a difficult thing. But I'm trying to turn your attention to the fact that no matter how good you are financially and how much you think you can provide, if God doesn't supernaturally bless you and help you to ensure that, there's no insurance that you have that it will ensure you against whatever tragedy or trials come your direction. And sometimes those things can happen and then before long you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't have anything. I'm up to my eyeballs and I owe the hospital bills and I owe all this and that and the other and what am I going to do? And the Lord said to the widow with the oil in 1 Kings chapter 17, He said, uh, the oil won't fail. But you know what's odd about that passage there? She's taking care of another individual there, the boy that's there with her in the passage, and he gives her enough oil to meet her needs so that she can make bread and be able to survive a famine. But it doesn't say she moved into the palace with Joseph. It doesn't say that all of a sudden there was this huge amount of prosperity. She started driving a Bentley to, to church every day and that she was wearing Jimmy Choo's and wearing a mink coat and carrying a Fendi or whatever else it might be, a Louis Vuitton. It doesn't say that. It said she had enough oil to get by every day. I like the widow with the mail. I call her a widder back in the days. I'm learning to get a little bit more sophisticated in my language. And that widow would come in there every day and she had enough meal to make a cake for the day. And then she'd look at that thing at night time and there's nothing in there. And then she'd look in there again and there's enough for today. And every single day, just like manna, there was just enough for the next day. Just enough. I wonder whether or not we'd be happy if we had just enough to make it through the next day. I wonder if the pressure that you feel on you to constantly work on provisions. Can I say this? Sometimes provisions can be a blessing, but sometimes they can be a bear trap and they can put you in bondage because you begin to trust on that provision as opposed to the one that provided it. And then you begin to think before you pray, I'll just put it on the plastic. And then you begin to think, well, what I'll do is I'll just depend on the money that I have in the bank or I'll just depend on the policy that I have. I'm not making light of that. I'm saying that when you begin to trust in that more than you trust in the Lord, then your focus has changed to down here instead of up there. Amen. Amen. The children of Israel, they came out of the land of Egypt and God knew they were headed to a place over there where mountains are on either side, the enemies behind them and the Red Sea's right in front of them. God knew the Red Sea was there and their path of escape was going to be blocked the moment they stepped out of Egypt. He knew what direction He was going to take them. But you know what they had to learn? The only direct place they could look in that situation was up. And sometimes the Lord allows those things to occur. This nation had a revival during the days of their depression. I'm not praying for that. I'm simply saying that from a spiritual standpoint, if that's what it took for the nation to turn to God, would you be willing to say, you know what, Lord, I mean, that's fine with me. See, it's easier to say if you're middle-aged and don't have much, but if you're getting a little older and you got a little bit, you're kind of like, well, wait a minute, let me enjoy it. Let the grandkids fend for themselves. Can I get a witness? You know I'm telling the truth. But what happens is, is we begin to lean on the security of knowing that I, I have enough to cover next week or next month or next year. We're that way. We insure everything now. You insure your mortgage. If you got a mortgage and you die, you've got credit life and you got a life insurance policy. If you have a car nowadays, you have to finance that thing for 10 years because your payments are through the roof. You could have bought a house for what you buy a car for nowadays. Don't be looking around right now because I'm like, I'm watching all y'all. I see your new car. That's nice. I'm glad you got a new car. $1,000 a month. Can't use $1,000 a month for nothing else. Going to need that new car. I mean, that's a, that's a nice new car. I appreciate that. But you know what? You can't eat that car. And you probably don't spend more than about an hour a week in it. But it looks good in the driveway. Requires a lot of maintenance. But you know what can happen, ladies and gentlemen? If you're not careful, you begin and instead of realizing that the Lord is the one that provides and that He will not faint and He won't sleep and He doesn't fail, the next thing you know what you begin to do? You begin to depend on uh, yourself as opposed to depending on Him. Amen. The doxology says, praise God from whom all blessings flow. It has a tendency to make our memory shorter. We get a little comfortable, don't we? We get a little, we don't really need the Lord. We got money in the bank. We got money in our pocket. None of us are starving to death. Am I right? And you know what though? I can tell you times in my own personal life where there's nothing in the bank. And there's not enough to cover what's coming at the end of the month that I know is coming. 
And I wish I could tell you I just was a bulwark of faith and just trusted Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I wasn't. I'm down in the middle of my living room rug and down there praying with her and we're bawling and squalling with peanut butter in the cabinet and uh, two-week-old bread in the cabinet and stuff. You say, oh, no, not you. Yeah, after I left down there, yes, it absolutely was. I didn't have anything. And pray and watch God provide and put enough meal in the bucket to make it for the next day. But they wasn't no leftover. You say, why is God trying to teach me? My God shall supply all your need through His riches and glory. Amen. Do you realize this? Can I say this about these provisions that are in this particular place? Sometimes debt, though, can be utilized to draw you closer to the Lord. Yes. Yes. Because when you finally wake up and realize it takes dollar bills that require sweat to be able to pay off the debt, it has a tendency to knock off your foolishness and realize I'm going to have to go to work instead of going to the club. Sometimes the responsibility of debt makes you go to work. It makes you realize I made a mess, but you know what else it can teach you? It can teach you, I don't want to get in this mess again. Amen. And you're a little slow to come off the hip when it comes to that plastic. Right. Or to go to the bank and say, hey, somebody's somebody going to want that back, right? Yes. Sure. Can I just tell you this, ladies and gentlemen? You're living in a day and time where people have a lot. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. That's it. Where people are more in love with that because it represents security to them. Yeah. Yeah. And there may be a time in this country where it's not worth anything. Right. Yep. Right. That's it. That's it. And you may not have a class system anymore. Amen. If you feel how all the oxygen kind of comes out, you say, well, it, it could happen. Yes. Yes. All it takes is just a cataclysmic one or two dominoes falling, and the next thing you know, in Germany during the times of the Depression and right at the end of the war there, you know what they're doing in order to buy a loaf of bread? They're taking all of their Deutschmarks and all that, and they're putting them literally in a wheelbarrow, and it take an entire wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread. People were starving to death. In this country here, during that time of the Depression, you'd stand in a soup line all day long to get a little bit of bread and to get some soup to try to take care of your family. That was a nation that right prior to that owned the big, big portion of the things in the world and we were more wealthy than we ever. I mean, we had come through the roaring 20s. And prohibition was a thing of the past and the dollar bills were flowing like the liquor. And then all of a sudden, somebody moved a domino and somebody pulled a pin and before long that whole thing came crashing down and all of a sudden people said, you know, what do we do now? Oh, well, listen, can I just suggest this to you? Before there's no more food in the cupboard, why don't you turn to God now and then yes. that way when it does happen, right. yes. you'll be more prepared for yes. it. Amen. I'm just trying to get you to turn your eyes on Jesus, look full in His wonderful face. Amen. See, the tendency is, is to think I've got the answers to everything. Sometimes those times of being indebted or those times of being without, they cause us to spend time in prayer with the Lord and to spend time and recognize. You know what happened over there in the book of Genesis? Those boys had to come over there to see Joseph, the boy they had sold in nearly 70 years prior to that. They had sold him into slavery, not knowing that God was using him to protect them and to sustain them. And Joseph goes over there during the first seven years of plenty and he lays up stuff. That's smart. He lays up stuff for the seven years of leanness and not knowing that God's using that whole famine and that lack of things to bring those individuals back to where they're supposed to be. Sometimes God will use the fact that we don't have in order to get us back where we should be. If you look in your Bible, you don't have to look there now, but I'd like to say this to you also. As you grow older, one of the things that goes or passes off is your strength begins to fail. Yes. Amen. We, we lean on the security, I guess you would say, financially, but then all of a sudden sickness comes around. Didn't expect that and didn't see that one coming. Yeah. Pretty good health, not overweight. Doctor comes in and says, hey... You're so bad off, you're going to stay at the hospital. We're going to watch you constantly to make sure you don't flop out before we get you fixed. Don't know how you plan for that. Hand of God happened to step in and give you a warning. Otherwise, we'd have had a funeral instead of a celebration service. But can I say this to you? Sometimes you survive a few things and we get a little too self-confident. 
We get a little too sure of ourselves. We get a little too much us, too much strength. We get this idea that now that we have arrived and now that we know all that there is to know, we got the power, we got the strength, we got the ability uh, to be able to make it through anything. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen, and in spite of what the smart aleck said, oftentimes pain is more harsh and difficult between your ears than it is in your body. I know some of us are getting old enough that we don't eat Rice Krispies anymore. We sound like them when we get up in the morning. Amen. I mean, you get up in the morning and you haven't been on your feet all night long and you stand up and your feet hurt. Amen. And you sound like snap, crackle, pop. Every time you take a step, something's cracking and something's moving and you feel like you're all discombobulated. Can I get a witness? Amen. You say, what happens? And all of a sudden, you know, you look at that 100-pound sack of fertilizer and you think it's just going to stay right there. Because there ain't no way I'm going to bend down there. Or you go get your little trial and your little sand bucket and you take out a little bit at a time and spread it out. It'll take you all day to put out 100 pounds of fertilizer. Boy, back in the day, you'd throw that in a hopper and you'd have the yard done before 7 o'clock in the morning. But nowadays, it's changed a little bit. Amen. David said, when I got old, I got, I got shaky. My strength failed. Toward the end of the book of Job there, he talks about his eyesight failing and yes. talks about his ears failing. Talks about his teeth falling out of his head. That's Job saying that's what happens when old age comes. But sometimes other things can take strength away from you. Disease can step in. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, you feel like you could charge hell with a squirt gun wearing gasoline britches and then the next minute the doctor comes in and gives you the diagnosis of a disease that you're going to live with like rheumatoid arthritis and you're going to have that for the rest of your life and you're not going to be sick enough to die from it but you're going to be in constant aches and pains and there ain't no medicine they can give you to knock it off. And you lay it up there, twist it up like a pretzel, and you're in aches and you're in pains. And literally every single day you're looking for is a friend of mine struggling right now. And you know what he said? He said, Preacher, you have no idea if I get 15 minutes with no pain, what a relief it is to me to have 15 minutes being pain free. I said, Brother Eric, I got no idea what that's like. He lives way up north of here, and I talk to him on a regular basis. So I said, brother, I, I can't imagine. He said, they're doing this, they're doing that, they've done this, they've done that, they're doing everything. He said, but because it's nerve pain, unless they just cut my head off, he goes, they can't stop the pain. And he said, I'm in pain all the time. The only time I don't know I'm in pain is if I'm asleep. But I know this, sometimes some things can knock the breath out of you, can't it? Not just disease, but what about death? Yes. Can't that take that strength away from you? Amen. All of a sudden, something happens, you didn't know about it, and you just feel sort of, I better sit down. That's it. it sort of makes your legs feel weak. Yes. You can't process it fast enough. You may not completely faint, but you done what we used to call, I don't know if they still do it or not, called DFO, you done fell out? Yes. For good reason? Your heart's broken. There's a fellow, I can't give you all of the details, but two days ago his daughter, he's a preacher. Her boyfriend came in and shot her. Killed her. Killed himself in front of his son. Preacher, pastor, pastor of a large church. Loves the Lord, believes the book, raised his kids right, done right. But sometimes things come into our life that are beyond our ability to be able to describe. And can I say this? And it surpasses our strength yes, it does. to be able to withstand the heartache and the pain that can come with a loss like that. Yes. I don't know how some of you have survived. I've had some losses some dear friends and things like that that have gone, but sometimes when death comes knocking at that inopportune time, that time when you're not prepared for it, that time when, you know, everybody's expecting you to be able to handle everything, then that comes. And people are like, hey, what are you going to do? And you're like, I don't know. I'm going to sit down and set a spell. And the pain and the heartache and the hurt continues 
long after everybody else has done moved on. Amen. And isn't it interesting, if you pause for a minute, how everybody becomes an expert in the fact that, okay, well, it's long enough. You ought to be over that by now. Yeah. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Amen. And they're always making a comparison. Yeah. Yes. And it's like, you want to literally, like, have a come to Jesus meeting with them and let them meet Jesus before you. And sometimes things come that happen in life. It's not just disease, it's not just a death. Sometimes it has to be with being disabled. I, I don't know, and I don't mean to accent this too much, but can I say this as carefully as possible? When I watched what she went through, when her daddy became disabled, she said, oh, no, not physically. He wasn't in a wheelchair. And he fought that walker. We'd try to get him. He'd, as soon as we were gone, he'd throw it down. He didn't care if he busted his head open. He, didn't, he was not going to be on that walker. And some of you saw him in his latter years and he still looked like he was 75 and he's 96. But his brain was gone. Every day. All day. Can I say this with no malice at all? People had no concept. They thought, Why aren't you, what's wrong with you? Why are you so touchy? Why are you so frustrated? Why are you so aggravated? Sleeping with a phone on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week for five years. Amen. And I know you don't like it, but too bad you can leave. I'm going to say this. Amen. And still trying to keep something normal. Five years. Yeah. Going every day. Calling every day. In and out of the hospital and in and out of the doctor. And, and knowing literally that dementia is not getting better. Oh, little glimmers here and there, but sometimes, boy, that strength just ebbs out and it has nothing to do with age. Amen. It is like somebody has emotionally stuck a hypodermic needle in you and there is a constant pull. Yeah. It'll make you old fast. Yep. It's sometimes worse than death. I'm not comparing... I'm saying sometimes death is sudden and at least you can move forward with the pain. But this is a slow, agonizing, painful. Amen. You know, what's amazing to me was how many people who had never even ex had experienced that were all of a sudden experts. Right. And telling us everything that, oh, you need to do this, you need to do this, you got to do this, you got to do that and all that. I'm listening to... Johnson down there, he's an old black fellow that took care of him the last couple of years. He had more sense than all them doctors. He said, preacher, he said, let me just tell you, this is how these people work. And this is how they think. And this is how they feel. And this is how you can help them. But you can't expect them to get better. Amen. You just have to help them where they are. Amen. Woo. I'm like, somebody's walking with the Lord. Because one of the hardest, most frustrating things is that when someone gets a disease, you expect them to take a pill and get better. And when they don't, man, can I say this? I'm using another D when strength fails. Sometimes depression. Depression is that. Can I say this? Y'all are home folks. Y'all protect me if he comes through the internet and gets me. That young stinking punk. You know what he said? That didn't sound very pastoral, did it? That stinking yellow-bellied sap sucker. You know what he said? Because I made the statement that sometimes the pain between your ears is greater than physical pain. Yeah. That pain between your ears is something that doctors and psychiatrists and pharmaceutical companies have put together to make you think that there's trouble in your head and it's not really in your head and so on and so forth. He went on to say... Of course, not to my face. But he, he, he heard that like, pfft, 
mental problems, no problem at all. I remember listening to an old preacher years ago. He was an old biscuit eater man. I mean, he weighed probably 400 pounds. His name was Billy Kelly. Brother Larry might remember him. He had a head big as a hog, man. I mean, he's a big old, big old fellow, man. <clears throat> and one time he said he was dealing with a Christian scientist. That's the people that believe all your sickness is in your head. And he said, uh, I guess she ain't never had no, this is him, he talks uh, kind of hillbilly. He said, I reckon she ain't never had no toothache before. He said, because the pain is in your head. <laughs> if you get a real toothache, she, he said, I'm I guarantee you the pain is in your head. <laughs> but you know what happens sometimes? That people say, oh, well, depression, that's no big deal. Can I remind you of this, if I could, please? Elijah was so physically exhausted that he became emotionally and mentally exhausted also. That is a guy that has just killed 850 prophets. Has called down fire from heaven. That is a guy who knows what it is to be by himself like Rambo and have God take care of him for three and a half years all alone. If there was ever a man, he was a man. There was no quit in that boy. But all of a sudden he gets a letter and that letter the Bible said and when he saw that he fled. You say what? His expectations got covered up with those disappointments. And before long the way he saw things wasn't how God saw things. And can I just remind you of this? The Lord found him laid up curled up like a little baby underneath a juniper tree because of what was going on in his head. I'll not come off of that. I'll tell you if that's your problem, maybe with that strength begins to get weak and you begin to struggle uh, emotionally. And I'm not just talking about uh, menopause or some kind of sickness or hormonal changes and things like that. I'm talking about real life for a Christian depression, discouraged, upset, bothered, broken heartedness is a good word to use there where your heart has been broken and has been shattered in a million pieces and the gloominess and darkness surrounds you and you feel like you can't even breathe. Yes, that's right. Right. Sure. Amen. Somebody comes along and says, what's the problem? Yeah. You look fine to me. Hmm. Well, I'm not. You might say. My strength failed. I'm depressed. Yeah. Preacher, what's depression? You go look it up. I'll tell you this. Nobody that has it needs a definition. Amen. Amen. The ones looking for it are trying to figure out to diagnose whatever it is they think they have. I'll give you your diagnosis. You're whacked out. But if you're depressed, you don't need a definition. You know it. Amen. Something ain't right. That's right. That's the sun come up, but it don't look like it used to. The stars are out shining, but they don't quite have the glimmer and the, gleason, uh, the glistening about them that they used to. The moon might be shining, but it doesn't mean anything anymore to you. All of a sudden, things have lost their luster and your strength fails. You can't think right. You can't move. It locks you down. And you go to the doctor and they try to diagnose it and they try to help you. But it doesn't always help. And you turn to the Lord and you pray and you beg and you ask. And can I say this? And sometimes it just doesn't feel like there's any relief. Amen. Sometimes it becomes your thorn in the flesh. Yes, and you have to learn to live with it. Yep. And live on in spite of it. And learn where your new norm is. Right? Amen. Not just because of COVID. Reset. I prayed and asked the Lord. The Apostle Paul had to have, in my opinion, the Apostle Paul gets caught up to the third heaven, beholds great, marvelous, wonderful things, comes back down. By the time you're in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, the Apostle Paul said that I have beheld things up there I haven't beheld before. And the Lord gave with that revelation a messenger of Satan to buffet me so that I would not be exalted above measure. He suppressed him. He depressed him. 
He said, you're going to have a physical ailment and it's going to be with you until the end of your ministry. And he put him down so that he could lift us up. Oh, you might know that theologically and even doctrinally, but practically, that's a rough road to hoe. That's a hard mountain to climb. And sometimes that death can be the loss of somebody that meant the world to you. Your whole life was spent taking care of them. You ever think about Cheryl Lentz, ever? I mean, she was Jim's wife. That's what she was known as, Jim's wife. That's the preacher's wife. That's Miss Cheryl. You ever think about it? She's still alive, by the way. Jim been gone a long time. She's still alive. My mama, daddy been gone 30, what, five years, I guess, thereabouts. Her whole life was around. Yes. You say, what is that? Strength gone. Emotional difficulty, because now where do I, where do I fit? Amen. Where do I go? What do I do? You ever think about Miss Amen over there? I'm not being funny. Yeah, that's right. You know how many I buried in her family? You know how she is? You know where she is right now? She's sitting right there by herself. She's got friends. Yeah. She's a blessing to this preacher. Yeah. Did you ever think about strength being gone? Pretty amazing, you know, preacher, I just don't feel like getting up and getting on. I can't blame you. That would be a hard road to hoe, wouldn't it? You come down through that passage and you start talking about the Lord mounting up with wings and, uh, of eagles and running and not being weary and walking and not being faint. And you're thinking to yourself, shoot, Lord, there have been times and things that have happened in my life that the strength has gone out of me and it's failed because of all the things that I've just given to you. And Lord, not only that, I'm scared to death about what's going to happen. I'm reading in Luke, men's hearts are failing them for the, the waves and the earthquakes and all those other kind of things that are going on. You turn on the news if you're fool enough to do that. I mean, no disrespect. They get you geared up. They get you worried up. They get you to thinking about things. They're showing you all kind of stuff that took place. And don't tell me that doesn't stir you. Listen, there is a thing in your system. It's got a long name, but let me just say it gets you jacked up and you can't keep it from jacking you up. You start seeing certain things, it all of a sudden calls that saber-toothed tiger to go into fight-or-flight mode. And you're looking to do something and they're telling you about nukes and they're telling you about uh, what's going to happen. And they keep making this rhetoric about World War III is going to break out. And then they're showing you stuff of World War II and they're showing you Vietnam and they're showing you the things that transpired, putting a thought in your mind of what's going to happen. You don't know. How do you prepare? You can't. The frustrating thing is, is that no matter what, you can't build a bomb shelter big enough to stay in long enough to be able to survive whatever it is that's coming. What is it that's coming? I don't know. There's a class five out there in the Atlantic. I know they say it might turn, but what if it doesn't? I mean, we're right in the eyeball, the bullseye, if it doesn't turn. They say as they break to a commercial. And then on the commercials, they're showing waves slamming up against trees and cars being washed away and roofs coming off of houses and you need to get a generator and you have to do that. Then you turn back on and they bring on the hurricane music and you're glued to something that's not even coming. Amen. But it might. And if it does, what you going to do? Get some gasoline and go west, young man. That wouldn't have done you much good last time when I was going from here to Monticello. Between me and Lake City, just past Lake City, Lake City to Monticello, right in through there, Cedar Bay, all that in there. Lord have mercy. There's pine trees that big around snapped off four or five feet off the ground. Not I've topped off. I'm talking about snapped off. They shut down that place out there. They had cut it because so many trees had fallen across I-10. They're out there lined up with semis. Back in the day, they used to line up the dump trucks and put asphalt in them. And then you put the machine behind it and the machine would push and the asphalt would fall off while they're topping the road. Now what they got is semis that are out there, flatbeds, that are loading up trees. There's so many of them snapped off. 
Wouldn't have done him much good to go west that time. But the next thing that happens is you get anxious about, but what if? There's only one thing you can insure yourself against. You can insure yourself against going to hell. But beyond that, you haven't got enough ways to insure yourself. And at some point in time, you know what has to begin to happen? We have to remember that our security lies in our faith on Him. Howard Hughes was a very wealthy man back in his day. I don't even know what the amount of money that he made back in the day was. Can you bear with me for just a couple more minutes? But he was a multi-billionaire. Built one of the first sea airplanes. Communication expert. Had everything in possibility that he could have. More money he could ever spend. I was involved with TWA, all this other kind of stuff. Here's the thing that you need to know. He wound up becoming a germaphobe. He was afraid of things he could not see. Built a place out in the middle of the desert where it was hot, where he wasn't thinking that anything would, and literally would have his food brought to him and make sure that it was surgically antiseptic in rooms that were covered like a kill room covered with bisqueen. Because he was scared to death of catching a cold or getting sick. And all that money and all the liberty and yet bound up. And unable to enjoy those things. No testimony at all that he ever turned to Jesus. And I can say because I didn't hear a testimony that after all of that he died and he's in hell right now. Can I say this, ladies and gentlemen? There's a time coming where you as Christians are going to start getting more and more persecution. And you're living in a day and time where you don't have to be an idiot to get persecuted. You don't have to have some kind of stupid manifesto and go out here and go out with a blaze and all that other kind of stuff. All you have to do is, is just say, I'm a Christian and I love Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to make fun of you. If the Bible's right, you know what will happen? Your own family will do that. Your own family, if the Bible's right, the prophet is not without honor save in his own country. Your own family will do that. You say, why? Just because you're doctrinally different? Because you want to live a life that's clean and right? Nowadays you have our kids that are growing up in schools. They're taking their choice away from them and turning them into what they want to be, which is a debauched way of looking at things. And they spend sometimes as much as eight hours a day with your kids. Five days a week. That is a huge influence when they are in a cesspool of human reasoning. You find out there's some unusual book that they've written that you're against and you go up and say anything, oh, you're a Christian? Yes, I am, but I don't want this taught to my kid. Right. Well, we'll determine what needs to be taught. No, you're not the Third Reich. And if that's what you're going to do, then now you've got a mess because now if you pull your kid out, you've got to teach them. Because the law says the kid's got to go till they're 16 and then they decide not to and all that. But you've got to still send them to school, am I right? Sure. Yeah. What are you going to do when the persecution comes for the right reasons? You know what's going to happen? I guarantee you your kids are going to be embarrassed. Because everybody else does it. Your kids are so in communication with each other. I don't have to go to youth camp to know this. Even our kids are so involved with each other. With Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and all that kind of stuff. There's a web that runs underneath or underground. I call it the Baptist underbelly. <clears throat> and some of you parents are in it. With the kids. Texting and talking to teenagers. Come on. Could somebody besides Joe say amen? amen. That's weird. Yes. You know what winds up happening? You know, did you, I don't know if you know this or not. You know, in public school, they don't even allow teachers to do that. Anyway, there's an underbelly in the church. 
Richard doesn't know. <laughs> And the preacher might be on that thread. <laughs> Probably not. Brother Sam doesn't know. You'd be surprised. But here's the issue. Whether or not we knew, the issue is, is all of a sudden, you've chosen not to be persecuted. You've chosen to go along with the crowd. There we go. That's right. And when a parent has the backbone to say, not in my house. You ain't doing that. Amen. Well, preacher, you know, in the day and time in which we live, you go ahead and do that. I'm going to preach against it. Right. And you can come and tell me about it and tell me you shouldn't talk that way and it's none of your business what I do in my family. I didn't say it was my business what you do in your family. I said, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says about it. You do whatever you want. But you're living in a day where people nowadays are going to the far country in droves. And they're going from the church pew. And through the aid of electronics, they're beginning to find themselves out there in areas where they have no business being. And the moment that you say no, you know what happens? Persecution comes. You don't even have to be standing on a street corner holding a Bible or a sign. You just have to show up at work one day and say, hey boys, we're going to pray before we have lunch. Pray? Yeah. I'm going to pray. I don't think you should pray. Isn't this a work-affiliated uh, situation here? No, we're going to eat. This is a God-affiliated So, What God? Don't ask me if you don't want to know. My God ain't Allah. We do not serve the same God. We do not worship the same God. And now because I've said that, some of you that are visiting, you're like, well now, you know, you can't really, I can say that. And there's going to be persecution. You say, why? Because you're absolutely defended. I am absolutely defended. My prophet is Jesus Christ. God manifests in the flesh. Not Muhammad is his prophet. I'm not the same as they are. There's a line to be drawn. I do not go to Mary to get my prayers through. And I apologize if you were Catholic, but you need to wake up and realize there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, and that's how you get saved. And the reason your prayers aren't getting through is because you're praying to somebody that's dead. I don't need a saint for everything. I'm working on being a saint. I need Jesus for everything. And just because of what I said to you, there will be persecution that comes because there is a right way and it is one way. You have to be some nut job. You just say, this is what the Bible says. And then guess what? If you don't want to do that... No problem. Go wherever else you want to go. Why come here? Don't bug us, man. Yeah. We're happy. Yeah. Well, preacher, you know, we believe in Ostler, Shantai, Untai, Bowtie, Economy, Honda. Okay, we believe in getting a bridle for the tongue we got, not trying to learn a new one. Yeah. We believe all that speaking in tongues does is point to you to make you think you're special. Yeah. And ain't nobody here special. Yeah. We don't do that here. We're not looking to shine a spotlight on anybody but Jesus. Amen. Persecution. My auntie, she spoke in tongues. Maybe she was drinking liquor. I mean, a lot of them did. Maybe she was choking on Tupelo. Do any of y'all know what that is? Y'all don't even know what that is? It's a little silver can called snuff. You got it. You can always tell when those people are level-headed because it run out of both sides equal. Most of them a little cockeyed. You kind of run a little more over on here. Don't you tell me you didn't know them old women used to dip snuff. They come to church dipping snuff and swallow it. That's why they never had no worms. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. I had an elderly woman that fell out in the projects one day and I happened to be there first and she's there and she's choking and I tried to hide like a few little bag of bones. I was scared I was going to break her and I finally got her down there and I just gotten ready to give her the, you know, the breathe on her like that and I hit her chest one more time and man, I mean a big old wad came up, boy. Red man. And she'd swallowed it and it got stuck in her pipe, you know, and then she got a deep breath and then rescue showed up and all that. I said, oh, you saved her. I said, no, uh, -uh man, I didn't. I just got out of the way. <laughs> you say, what? She'd sit on that front porch and chew and spit. Yeah. yeah. 
and go to church and Austin LaShawn tie and tie, bow tie economy Honda. Roll around so bad you'd have to throw a sheet on her and make her like a holy roller. <laughs> Why don't y'all do that? Because it ain't in the Bible. But because we're not something for everyone, persecution's going to come. They think we're narrow minded. I am narrow minded. I'm so narrow minded a skeeter can land on my nose and with one leg kick me in both eyes. You say, why do you have to be that way? I'm scared of the other way. You sound like a redneck. Oh, cut it out, man. Label it however you want to label it. I'm just a straight laced, Bible believing Christian. And I actually believe it is what we're supposed to be, not just do. And so I think that I'm supposed to preach that to you that, hey, you know what? It's time that we realize a persecution comes and so you're not surprised when they make fun of you. Oh, you go to church? Yeah, I do. Well, when do you go? Once a month or on Easter? No, I go every Sunday. I go to Sunday school. I go Sunday morning. I go Sunday night. I go back for another dose on Wednesday. We have a special meeting. I go every night of the meeting. Man, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? We go into the beach. See you later. I hope this tune plays in the back of your mind all day. Dun 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 I mean, that's what happens you go to the beach on Sunday. I hope Barnacle Bill gets you. You say, well, why would you do that, preacher? I'm supposed to be where I'm supposed to be right now. Can I say this to you, ladies and gentlemen? We're just talking about the fact that many of us have lost faith in the fact that Jesus isn't going to fail you. He's not unaware of what's happening right now. He's very much aware of the situation, circumstances. You know what's weird about that? Is He knows what each one of us is going through individually. Not just corporately, individually, as far as the world is concerned. I'm talking about each single one of us that's here today. Two, three hundred people sitting here. And every one of you has got idiosyncrasies and problems. Can I get a witness? Yes, sir. And you all have some kind of problem bothering you. I could preach the rest of the outline. There's about six more things up there where the Lord doesn't fail. But can I just say this to you? Every one of us has special needs, problems, difficulties, and things going on in our life. Here's the odd thing. I don't know all of them. But I know somebody that does. And I know that whatever it is you're going through and whatever I've already preached on or whatever it is that you drew up while I'm preaching, I know that the God of the universe is never too busy. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He's not up there blind and can't see. Deaf, he can't hear. Crippled, he can't come pick you up. He is very much aware of what's going on. How long is he going to let the movie run? I don't know. We're walking by faith and not by sight. He does tell Thomas, he said, Blessed are you because having seen, you believe. But blessed are those who having not seen, have believed. Hey, have you seen him yet? Listen to this fool of a preacher. I've been preaching about somebody I have never seen going to a place I have never been to before. And I'm telling you, it is just as real as if I had seen him. And I'm telling you, he is never asleep. He knows what you're going through. He knows the problem that you have. His arm is not too short that He cannot deliver you. God forgot me. God can't forget you. You're in Him. You're bone of His bone and flesh of His flesh. I don't care if it was a little boy that broke your heart. God sheds a tear. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. Tell us who He is and we'll help Him shed some tears in the name of Jesus. Ain't that right, Alabama? You can't hear things like that. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes we get to a point where we think God forgot. Yes. Yes. God don't know what I'm going through. And I prayed and God ain't doing nothing. No, He's doing something. He's just moving the chess pieces around on the board. Amen. Amen. Sometimes He knows you don't need a prescription. You just need to wait. Ain't that what he said? No, Lord, I want to be with them eagles up there flying. Everything ain't always celestial. I mean, I like to fly with them angels too. As long as they're carrying me. Right? But all the help of God is not always flying on the mountain. Man, 
Woo! Boy, it was sure good, boy. A lot of times I ain't like that. I'd like to run and not be wearied. Elijah only did it once. He must have got tired after the run. Because he never run no more after that. But everything ain't always in a hurry. But he says this, but they that wait, they'll walk. And he doesn't say, and they shall, look at the passage. In Isaiah 40, are you looking at it? Look at it closely. They shall walk and not be faint, ain't what it says. What does it say? And they shall walk and what? Not faint. Did you just get that? Yes, sir. He said, if you're walking with the Lord, you're going to walk, but you're not going to be faint. Amen. That's what he says, a promise. Yeah. Here's the problem. I've got to wait, and I've got to be willing to walk. When I need something done, I hate walking. You got a prayer request? Don't you tell me you like waiting. Man, when I go to praying, other than to bless the food, I say that fast so I can eat fast. Right? Yeah. I don't hate them. Other people come in to go pray. We're going to pray for, we're going to pray the food. And then they're going to pray one day we're getting ready to preach prayers. Hey, God is great. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's eat. Think about that. There's not no time for showboating around while we, we food's getting cold, man. Ice cream's melting, man. Let's eat. You got all of a sudden, oh God, now we want to thank you. For, no, oh God, shut him up. We ready to eat. I know how you are. You'll be reaching under there while he's praying, looking to see if he's watching and pray, taking stuff off the eating while you're waiting on him to get through with that long-winded blessing, he calls it. It ain't no blessing. Sound like a curse to me. Amen. Stop them long blessing prayers. Amen. Public or otherwise. You're not there to save the restaurant. You are there to bless the food. Stand out front and have street preaching after you're done. But we trying to eat. Amen. Especially if somebody asks you to pray and your food came early. And because they ordered some weird thing, you know, their food ain't coming for another 15 minutes. And in the South, you know how it is, you're supposed to wait till everybody gets their food kind of a thing. No, I'm ready to eat. Well, we're going to wait till you get... No, we ain't waiting. Pray. We fixing to eat. You'll learn next time, don't order something so stupid it takes that long for you to order. Amen. And then we're going to be hurrying you up because we're ready to leave because we, we ordered something with the get, get here now. Just remember when you pray, you ain't praying to save the restaurant. You're praying to bless the food. But can I say this to you? There's times you prayed and it just seems like the Lord's You've been a Christian any time at all. It's not just that he ain't, an he ain't answering the way you want him to. He ain't answering. He ain't talking. Them the hard ones. I learned to deal with the no's. I, at least I got an answer. And I'm real good at them yeses. Unless I say, Lord, would you have me go make it right with my brother? Yes. Uh, now, wait a minute, Lord. I don't... <laughs> Do you want to slow down on that answer just a little bit? But it's them. See, if it ain't yes, and it ain't no, you know what it is? It's wait. You know what that means for me? It means I've been running too fast. I've been flying too high. And he said, you better slow down and wait. The wait comes before the walk. I can't keep walking. Until he's caught up. You just got that, didn't you? You see, some of you feel as a Christian that hesitating is something wrong with that because you've been taught hurry, 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 faster, 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 more and more and more, quicker, quicker, quicker. Go, 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 do, 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 do. Sometimes you know what you have to do? <clears throat> Can I ask you a question and I'm done? For those of you visiting, that really doesn't mean much. I am the epitome of a lying preacher when it comes to that. 
What do you think Moses was doing when he spoke to the Lord out of the burning bush? You think he is running or setting? How about Elijah? He's a great preacher, wasn't he? Elijah's a great preacher. You see the Lord speak to Elijah on a number of occasions, but the most formative time, what was Elijah doing while he was laying down under a juniper tree? And the Lord caught up with him. And before he sent him on his journey, walking, he had him rest and sit down and have fellowship with him. I think you'll find the apostles were sitting in fishing boats and by tax tables when the Lord caught up with them and said, follow me. Here's what I'm trying to get across to you to take the pressure off. The world and all of its devilment is coming this way in leaps and bounds. And the temptation of the pressure is, is I've got to hurry and do more. When I'm telling you, you need to learn to wait. You need to learn to wait. Be in such a hurry. It's a long road. Been called a marathon. I gotta hurry. I gotta hurry. I gotta hurry. That's not the Lord. Nowhere in the Bible except for salvation, nowhere does He tell you to hurry. You know what He says? He just gave you the verse. Wait. I say, wait. That doesn't mean wait. It means pause, pull over. Take some time to catch your breath. Get reacquainted. Before you're in, like, Lord, Lord, let's, 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 let's go. Wait. Lord, to catch up with you, you know what you might find? He might say to you, I know you were fixing to go down that path. I sure am glad you waited because we'd have had to come back here because this is the crossroads. I want you to go that way. She's in such a hurry, you're going so far down that road. Now you're trying to convince yourself that that's where you're supposed to be. And what I wanted you to do was wait on me. And if you'd have listened to my instructions first, we'd have already been a... So we got to take all that, ripple it, and then we got to... Sure. Now you're running behind the time. So, okay, let's learn that one step at a time. Amen. Amen. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not. How? He spent enough time walking with him, he got to know him. So much so, they become synonymous and before long, he's just like the Lord. The Lord hadn't forgot you. Maybe what he's wanting you to do is just sit and soak a bit. Preacher, we got all these things we got to get done and all that. Just, just, just slow down. Slow down. You're too enamored with movement. Watch this now. You ready? You're going to be upset. I'm going to offend you with Scripture. You ready? Be still. Why? And know something you don't know when you're running. Know that I'm God. You've got to be still. Get them ants out your pants. Bees out of your britches. Settle down. One step at a time. Little at a time. One step. Lord, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, just checking. Lord, you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay, just checking. Lord, see, I know what it's like to walk without you. And before long, I get to where I don't even miss you. I don't even realize you dropped off. Where you get that from, preacher? Almost done. You ready? Samson wist not that the Spirit had departed from him. Yeah. I'm going to help you. You got a family member in trouble? You in a hurry for him to get right? You in a hurry for him to get... You're the one bearing the stress. It ain't affecting them at all. They could care less. So what do you have to do? You got to wait for the Lord to do something. Amen. Lord, you need to do something now. 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 You may not want him to do something in as big a hurry as you think he does. Right. So what do I need to do? I need to learn to wait. Slow down. Enjoy the trip. Nothing except salvation needs to be done in a hurry. They asked Martin Luther, and he was getting ready to go preach at a meeting one time, and they said, uh, Mr. Luther, if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do? 
in a very slow, very methodical tone of voice, he said, I'd plow my taters. You'd plow your taters? He said, I'd plow my taters. Well, why would you do that? He said, he said, because in order for me to do what God wants me to do, I have to do that on a daily basis. I'm planning as if He's coming any day. But every day I have to plow my taters. I'm not changing what I'm doing. Because I'm already doing it every day. Heads are bowed.